Hello and welcome to this episode of Self Made with D Brown CEO. Joining me today is the Senior Director of Global Ratings for S&P. She's a graduate of Jackson State University and she's also the chair of the Jackson State Development Foundation. Please help me welcome G Johnson to Self Made. G Thank you, D. I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so, G, we want to be able to really set the stage for your journey to success. Um, a young African-American female from the rural Mississippi Delta that has worked her way all the way up to Wall Street. So to kind of help set the stage, let's talk about um, your, your, your younger year, your early life. Let's talk about when you was a child growing up in Clarkston, Mississippi. What was that like? Uh, I had a really happy childhood. Um, I grew up in a home with my mother and my father. I have a younger sister and my father's mother, who we affectionately call Granny. And so um, we um, had a basic life. Uh, two working parents, my parents were educators, so education was paramount. Uh, I, I now chuckle about the kids who have all of these different activities over the summer. My summer activities were learning how to swim, Right. And my mother, who was uh, an elementary school teacher at that time, basically took a card table and worked with me over the summer with various principals, particularly those in math. And so that's what we did in the summertime uh, as a kid. I went to high school and I took uh, all of the advanced classes and then decided to go to Jackson State University afterwards. So in Clarksdale, Mississippi, there are really, to my knowledge, no Wall Street bankers, right? So, or Wall Street, so how do you, or did you ever envision that one day you would be working on Wall Street? No, I, I did not. Uh, what I wanted to do was very simple. I decided that I wanted to do whatever it took for me to drive a drop-top BMW. <laughs> that was my dream. Uh, and so... Uh, I did the things that I liked in, in life. I was really good in math, so I was a math major at Jackson State. I became very interested in the law, and so I went to law school. And then uh, I worked at the bankruptcy court, and it's, it's at the bankruptcy court where I really was able to refine what it was that I felt I was really good at. And so I uh, was able to secure an opportunity uh, on Wall Street, working for S&P in structured finance, which has a very large bankruptcy uh, analysis component. And so I was able to leverage that and, and actually end up on Wall Street. So I never really set out to work on Wall Street. I really wanted to just make sure that I could do something that made me happy and where I was able to really take care of myself. So let's kind of take a step back. So you were at Jackson State uh, University, Jackson, Mississippi, HBCU. What was your experience like there? Uh, my experience at Jackson State University was one of, it brings back very loving memories. Uh, it was a family, and uh, it was a family that had deep tradition because my parents had also attended. So I knew about the school prior to me attending. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet an amazing group of fellow students. I was in the Honors College, and so I ran not only with just fellow HBCUers, but also those that had the same level of dedication to their studies because you had to have a minimum GPA to even be in the Honors College. I also had amazing um, professors who nurtured each of us individually. And so they encouraged us to do our best. And when encouraging us to do our best, it didn't mean you need to make A's, it meant you needed to do your personal best. And so that was my experience at Jackson State, one of a loving, nurturing environment where the school and the professors met each student at their point of need. So you were a STEM major at Jackson State University, but you ended up leaving Jackson State going to law school at the Ohio State University. Absolutely. So at what point did you decide that I'm going to go into law? Because it's not a natural you know, migration from STEM to law, so something happened at some point. Well, what happened is, is that I majored in what I was good in. I really believe that you should major in things that you're very passionate about, and math was one of them. Uh, after completing, um, I'm sorry, towards the end of my junior year, we were taking electives, and I took an elective uh, which was called Introduction to Law. And at that moment, in taking that class, I realized that there were 
other options for math majors than being a teacher or going into engineering. And so I basically took a pivot, started to apply to law school, and got in. I think I was a very attractive candidate because I have the capacity, based on my law degree, I'm sorry, my math degree, to think very linearly and critically. And those are, right. are two really good um, um, mindsets that you have to have in order to be successful, not only in law school, but as an attorney, whether you are a practicing attorney or like me, a non-practicing attorney. So let's fast forward just a little bit. So you leave Jackson State, you go to the Ohio State University. There had to be some culture shock or some differences or tell me about that transition. Uh, I, I, I think that's a very good way to describe it. Uh, culturally, I had grown up in a southern state, had gone to college in a southern state, and now I was in the Midwest. And so just uh, from a cultural perspective, I think it was much different. Um, the differences with, with the universities was, was most apparent to me because I had gone to a school where everyone was very close. It was very tight knit. Uh, you know, the football games were, you know, an over the top experience. Right. <laughs> and, um, you know, we got very dressed up in order to go to a game. And so when I went to my first Ohio State game and people were in sweatshirts, I mean, I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, and just the, the culture of being in Ohio. Ohio yeah. is much different than it is in Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi is more homegrown. Everyone's like really, you know, I know who your parents are. And in Ohio, it, it was different. But I feel like in Ohio, it gave me the opportunity to grow in my own, into my own self. It wasn't like in Mississippi where everyone knew my parents. This was, I had to make it on my own with my right. own name. And so it, it, was a, it was a great um, opportunity and a great way for me to transition from something that I felt was very uh, protective yeah. into trying to make it my own. Right, but law school in and of itself uh, has to be very challenging. So what was your biggest challenge once you entered law school at Ohio State? I think the biggest challenge I had was going from math, where there's always a right answer, to going to the law, where there's never a right, <laughs> right. answer. And so the Socratic method initially was, was difficult for me to navigate because I was always looking for that right answer. Right. But I think once I was able to... Um, make that transition, it became a little bit more natural for me because it was like, I, I knew I had the critical thinking skills. It just was a different way. It was almost like I needed to rewire how I processed information. And so I tweaked that a bit and then the rest is history. The rest is history. So tell me about that day. You had to go take the, uh, the bar exam and when you got your results back, can you, do you recall that day? I absolutely recall that day. Tell me about that day. Um, my friends took the Ohio bar, which was a three-day bar. I took the Georgia bar, which was a two-day bar. And so my results came out first. Okay. And so uh, I had a friend who took the Georgia bar with me. And uh, because he lived in Georgia, his results came in first. And he said, oh, the results are out. I was like, oh, no, oh, no. And he said, if your letter is a thin letter, you passed. <laughs> if your letter is a thick letter, you didn't. I was like, well, what do you mean? Because the thick letter is saying, here are the, the process for you to retake the bar. <laughs> so the letter comes. I open it. I get the letter. Go down to the mailbox, get the letter. And it was definitely a thin letter. But I didn't believe him. I was like, no, I don't know. I don't know. And I got the letter and I opened it up. And I act. I, I perform like those ladies that win the sweepstakes. <laughs> Ed, Ed McMahon was out there. Oh, Ed McMahon that brought me the $25 million. I screamed. I hit the floor. I mean, I just was so excited to have passed the bar on the first try. I mean, it was it was pretty bad. And I called my best friend. I was screaming. She said I was screaming. So she thought I was injured. I couldn't even get the words out. So it was, it was, it was a great experience. And, you know, I, the score that I had in Georgia was high enough for me to wave into D.C. And so I was, that was a really proud moment for me. Oh, it had to be a proud moment mm -hmm. for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so you passed the bar exam. How do you land on Wall Street? Tell me about that story. Well, uh, at the time I had a, I was working in, uh, as a federal judicial clerk with the United States Bankruptcy Court judge. 
and you needed um, to have a bar, not a particular state. So yeah. the, me working in Ohio and having passed the Georgia bar worked because it was the federal court. Right. Um, we learned a lot. I, I helped draft opinions. We learned about uh, pr pr process and procedures. Uh, I think that's where I learned to be very operationally efficient yeah. uh, from, from the judge. And I heard about this opportunity with S&P in their Chicago office, and it was um, to do structured finance. And structured finance is a type of bond financing where you're not really looking at uh, cash flows or you're not really looking at um, like balance sheet. You're looking more at the legals. And so there is um, an aspect of the uh, analysis that involves bankruptcy when you're looking at it, what we call a special purpose vehicle. Right. And I felt like I can do this because I'd, I had the legal background. I had taken a lot of classes that were tied to finan uh, financial um, distress, like uh, bankruptcy um, classes, secure transactions. And then I'd had that experience with the bankruptcy court. And so I applied and got the opportunity. And when you talk about you know the differences between uh, living in Mississippi and living in Ohio, yeah. it was like moving to another large Midwestern city. And so I ended up uh, getting the opportunity and I moved to Chicago for S&P's and working in their regional office initially. So before I ask you another question about S&P, I want to understand from you, because we may have other law students that are watching the mm -hmm. program, how important do you think clerking is for uh, a young, a young lawyer? I think it is one of the most memorable um, opportunities that I've ever had. You get to learn the law from the perspective of the judge. You're watching very magnificent attorneys argue their positions and then you have to take the law and apply it to right. see which one of those arguments closely fits with the law. You not only get to, to see it from that perspective, but you're doing all of this under the watchful eye of a judge. And my judge was very vested in, in my success. And so it was, I think it's like one of the best opportunities I've had uh, ever in my career. I'm still very uh, close to my judge today based on that relationship that we develop because it's a, it's a very small um, community. It's the judge the bailiff, the secretary, and the judicial clerk. And you have a you know, book of credits that you, a book of, port, um, of filings that you actually have to make sure are done correctly. Gotcha. Now, back to S&P. Talk to me about your current role at S&P because I know it is, a number one, you've broken a, the glass ceilings to get there. And it's a very, I think, prestigious uh, position. So talk to me, to me about the role that you serve right now. Okay. So currently, I am an analytical manager of the Global Funds Ratings Team, and it's a team of analysts, 15 analysts, that's spread across the globe. We sit in three, on three different continents, and we're responsible for providing ratings for over $5 trillion in rated assets. The type of assets that we rate are either money market funds or bond funds. And we use, though, we use a criteria in order to do so. And some of the types of um, fixed income products that we rate are money funds, bond funds, ETFs, local government investment pools, and SMAs, separately managed accounts. And what the team can do is provide ratings on any fixed income portfolio of assets that are either actively or passively managed. And so currently, you manage $5.2 trillion? We have $5.2 trillion of rated assets in our portfolio, yes. So getting to become the senior director at a global company like S&P uh, couldn't be a walk in the park. <laughs> so talk to me about your journey um, from first entering um, the organization to where you are now. How did you get there? Well, I got to this particular position uh, based on uh, perseverance uh, and um, just sheer hard work. Um, I started as an analyst, as a structured finance analyst, and then worked my way up to run that group. I then moved over from rating securities on the short end of the curve, is what they call it, 
to rating the investors that purchased the securities on the short end of the curve and then worked my way up to become the manager of that particular team. But it has not been a straight trajectory. Um, some of the things that I've had to do uh, to, for, my, for, for my own self were to volunteer for other opportunities. And so I've had uh, non-analytical opportunities that have basically given me the opportunity to see the world. So for example, I uh, volunteered to be uh, a part of a rotation program. And in that rotation program, I got the opportunity to rate um, money market funds from another jurisdiction, which was um, EMEA um, in Europe. I was housed in, in London. While in London, uh, the company had um, to become compliant with some Dodd-Frank regulations. And I was selected as one of 100 uh, global uh, analysts to fly to New York, move to our New York office and work on that project. And so I, I sorely enjoyed working in, um, in Europe. I'm a travel junkie and every weekend I was going to some other country, but you know, that was a different opportunity. And so I, I did go to New York and work there for a while and then came back to Chicago as an analyst. Uh, right before the pandemic hit, uh, I was selected to be the manager of this particular group. And so it has been challenging to try and manage a team. You know, we sit in eight regional offices from home, but we've somehow figured out how to to make that work. And so that's what my current role is. So talk to me about the importance of mentorships and sponsorships in order to get to where you want to go in, in life and business? I remember someone told me at a conference, you need two people in this world. Two people and, two, and one additional thing. You need a mentor, you need a sponsor, and you need to understand the differences between the two. And I think the reason uh, that you need the mentor is to bounce ideas off and to get a different perspective. Right. You need a sponsor because you need someone to speak about your capabilities in the room when you're not in the room to right, speak for yourself. Right. So that's, that's what I, I think some of the bigger things are. Now, being uh, an African-American and a woman in your position, uh, then being a STEM major, I'm sure that when people see you uh, in your position, they have to wonder, like, how did you get here? Do you get those type of looks or reactions? I get those looks all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how did I get here? Uh, I think I got here partially because I have uh, an, an openness to letting life happen. And so I do like to a, a, a more of a controlled life, but I like it controlled to a point because I feel like where you let go is where the magic happens. And so I majored in something that I knew I was good in. I took um, the critical thinking and the analytical skills that I gained as a math major, leveraged those for law school, ended up working at the bankruptcy court, which, which had a large component of that analysis, which is what I leveraged in structured finance, and then switched over in structured finance in order to, to do uh, money market funds. And so for me as a math major, that progression feels very linear. It feels like I went from A to B to C to D, but I always feel like I, I left just enough room for that magic that I'm talking about to happen. Right. And so I feel like if people um, would uh, leave a little bit more room for the unknown and have faith that it will always work out, I think, that's, I, I think having that philosophy is how I got here. Hey, I think that's a great philosophy because you have to, if you know the outcome, uh, that's a requirement for you to take <laughs> before you, for you to do something. There's going to be a lot of things you're going to miss. But there are people that, uh, you know, have that mindset. They want to, as they say, go for the sure thing. But you do have to leave that, that space uh, for the unknown and take risks in order to, um, to be highly successful. I know that your mom and dad were very influential in your life uh, and that led to you going to Jackson State. Uh, were there any other people uh, in your life that were part of that sphere of influence that helped you get to where you are? I would say offhand, my grandmother, my father's mother. 
Um, she was uh, exceptionally smart. Uh, even though I would say she was not formally trained. Mm -hmm. um, she uh, worked really hard, had an extremely high work ethic, and believed education and real estate were the two things that were key to financial independence. And so she sacrificed for my father to be able to go to college. And then when I came along, I, I had a really good roadmap because it was set up in order to, 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 to do the educational piece. And um, she never felt like going to college was an option. And in the house, because she lived with us, we didn't talk about college being an option. The discussion was about where are you going right. after you finish that first leg? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes uh, uh, crack jokes uh, about my own family. I consider myself like the, the slow one in the family <laughs> because I have the least number of Greek degrees when you compare my mother, my father, and my sister. So uh, I, th I think my grandmother was very influential. She also was very uh, much about real estate. Yeah. And so I think that's where my passion for not only uh, real estate personally comes from, but also in working uh, on the board and sometimes in my job dealing with the, the various uh, levels of commercial real estate and the financing pieces of it. So uh, I know you are a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And anytime I have um, <laughs> someone that's in a fraternity and a sorority on my show, I want to highlight it primarily because it gives me another chance to say I'm a member of Cap Alpha Psi <laughs> Fraternity. <laughs> but, se but seriously, I do want you to speak to me about, um, you know, your sisterhood and what it's meant to you. Well, I am a very proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And uh, for your audience, I'd like to say that it's a little bit different for um, black Greek letter organizations in that that public service commitment is a lifelong commitment. And that's really, you know, I think what we have in common that the Divine Nine, that commitment goes well beyond um, uh, college right and the camaraderie and sisterhood or brotherhood go well beyond college uh, many of my best friends are also a member of, of the sorority as also my mother and so I learned about uh, the requirement to give back growing up and so my values were aligned with Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And so that's where uh, I, I learned how to do public service at home. And I think I just refined it with the sisterhood of Delta. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to start wrapping the show up, I do want you to talk about the work you're doing at the Jackson State Development Foundation, where you serve as the chair of the uh, foundation, because I do think that's very, very important work that you're doing there. Thank you. Uh, one of the things is, is that uh, it all came about because I was giving back. I was trying to uh, finally took the time to do some estate planning and I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, I gave a sizable endowment from my estate to the school. And from there, my name was uh, presented to the board at that time. And then they, in, they extended me an invitation. I think I arrived at Jackson State's Development Foundation at a time when the level of expertise that I had gained was necessary for what was going on on the board at that time. Uh, I have enjoyed working in this capacity because it's, again, another public service uh, type role where I'm volunteering yeah. and I'm able to provide a, um, a high level of expertise from Wall Street to my beloved alma mater. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it feels great to be able to give something to Jackson State today, as well as giving something to them, um, you know, upon my death. You know, uh, great institution uh, that has served the, uh, the community and the country well. I wanted to, just to wrap up by asking this final question. Uh, what's next? You are at the top of your game, so what's next for you? Well, D, I never feel like I'm at the top of my game. I always feel like there is something that you can learn at any given time in your life. Uh, but I do feel like from this point in my life, I've worked on um, non-for-profit boards. Uh, I'm sorry, I've been uh, a member of a non-for-profit board. I've been a member of now of a, an institution of higher learning board. And ideally, I would like to um, start looking at more corporate boards. 
uh, at my job. We are working on a lot of new initiatives, uh, not only for my current role in my group, but also as a company. And, you know, I've been there for, you know, a little over 20 years and have watched the company grow and expand. And I'm very excited about the new initiatives that we have at S&P as well. So that's what I would say is next for me. Well, I'm sure whatever you decide to do, you're going to continue to have great success at it. Uh, I admire the work that you're doing uh, for Jackson State Development Foundation because uh, you are you know, serving um, a very critical uh, role because there's always a gap that needs to be filled when it comes to educating uh, people of color. And I think that's very noble and honorable work. And I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you it's very much for having me. It's been my pleasure to have me. you. Absolutely. And to my viewers, thank you for watching. And remember, without you, there's no me.